All right, everybody. How did the uh, the energy assignment go yesterday? Amazing. Amazing. That's what I like to hear. I like the enthusiasm, even if it's forced. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and uh, get. So, plan for the rest of this week. Tomorrow, tomorrow and Friday, you'll have another paper assignment that'll be based on counting protons, neutrons, and electrons. We're going to go over that today. You won't have a lab this week because Tom's is gone tomorrow and I'm gone Friday and Monday. So uh, he and I are going to talk about what Monday is going to look like after lecture today. Um, but basically, it's just going to be a paper assignment for the rest of this week. Finish up the stuff from yesterday. Were you able to finish the assignment yesterday or just get a good start on it? Good start. A lot of them are still working on their lab. So okay. Last week. Okay. Or finishing the lab because they were finished last week. So then it's okay that we're not adding another lab assignment. It's just a paper one, right? You can do that at any point over the weekend, get help on Monday of next week, et cetera. All right. Um, any questions on about energy before we get into new stuff? Anything in particular? The phase change calculations? I know that. Reusing the same, redoing the same calculations over and over again with different numbers is not always the most exciting thing to do, but it's the best way to really get a handle on how these these calculations work. Um, and pretty quickly, you know, all of those calculations where we're talking about and what is the heat of vaporization versus the heat of fusion, and use doing that conversion to calculate to go from uh, if I have. 325 grams of water, and I want to know how much energy it's going to take to evaporate that. That whole idea of for every one gram it takes, and actually I, I said evaporate, but let's say um, melt that much ice, since I know that number off the top of my head. Um, this type of conversion is going to continue to be really important. So I really want to drill it into our head. There's the Q equation that we use when there's a change in temperature. But other than that, when we're trying to get an energy for from a specific amount of, of a substance or for a specific amount of a reaction, this is going to be the way to do it. Write it like a conversion factor. That's going to serve you well once we get into chemical reactions because chemical reactions also have energies associated with them as well. And predicting how much energy they're going to give off or absorb for the reaction to happen is going to be a big part of well, chemistry, but of what we're going to do from uh, once we start introducing uh, concepts like moles and, and balanced reactions. All right. So if there's no pressing questions there, let's do a practice. What's the total amount of energy required to heat a 50 gram sample of ice starting at negative 12 Celsius? That let me adjust the, there we go. Starting at negative 12 Celsius to liquid water at 38 Celsius. So body temperature. So going from minus 12 Celsius to 38 Celsius, including a phase change in the middle. Start by drawing that heating curve, right? Label what sections are flat, what sections are temperature change, Q1, Q2, Q3. Let's try and calculate this. I'll give you a five minute or a couple minute head start, and then I'll start working it out on the board. Ask working groups if you need to. We're starting at minus 12 Celsius. We're going to be adding energy. 
I'm not going to draw this to scale, but let's just say we're, we're putting joules in. What's the first thing that's going to happen? It's going to increase in heat until, is it going to go all the way up to 38 all in one go? What has to happen in the middle? Phase change. So how far does it go before you hit a phase change? To zero. So it goes from minus 12 to zero. And what does the temperature do once you hit zero Celsius? Plateaus. And then where does that plateau end? I guess I could do this a little closer to scale. What's, hot, what's true at the end of that plateau? It starts increasing again, right? We, we, at the end of this plateau, that's when we've melted all the ice. Now we can start dumping energy. When we continue dumping energy in, it's going to increase temperature again. Is the slope of this line going to be steeper or not as steep? Why? See, yeah, like, is it steeper or flatter? Why? Or is it going to be the same? That's the other option, right? It's going to be one of the three. What's the specific heat of ice compared to water? It's about double, right? So, is I for if I put ten joules of energy in? Does the ice change have a bigger delta T or does water have a bigger delta T? Why? So one gram of water, of liquid water, takes four joules to change a degree. One gram of ice takes two joules to change a degree. So for the same amount of energy, the ice should actually have double the delta T which means that it'll actually be flatter after the phase change. It's pretty steep because ice doesn't take as much energy to change temperature. It's a, the higher your specific heat, the lower your slope, the smaller your slope will be. That doesn't really have any bearing. I mean, we didn't have to draw this to scale. I just want you thinking about what specific heat means and how it affects your change in temperature. High specific heat means less change in temperature. So what are the three sections, <coughs> excuse me, that we are going to calculate here? We have two delta T sections and one phase change, right? So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q1 and Q3 are going to be almost identical, right? They're both just using the Q equation. Delta T for Q1 is going to be 12 Celsius, right? Using CP of ice, so 2.22, we can find Q1. And mass is 50 grams. So Q1 is going to be 50 grams times 2.22 joules per gram degree Celsius times 12.0 degree Celsius. What's Q3 gonna be? Listen, we don't have to take them in order. Since Q1 and Q3 are really similar calculations, we might as well put them next to each other, right? So Q3, still 50 grams. But now it's liquid water, so we're using 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And it's going to be 38.0 Celsius for our delta T. Don't even have to do any algebra in this case, right?
I'm going to get something like 1.3 kilojoules out of 1,300-ish joules for Q1. 1,300 and what? 32. So how many sig figs are we going to keep? Three. So call it 1.33 times 10 to the 3 joules. Getting a number for Q3. 50 times 4 is about 200 times about 40, something like, what do we get? 10,000, right? No, 7,000. Oh, 7,000. So 7.9, he's a 9.4, nine, nine, nine. then round up, so 10 to the third. All right, we've done enough of these at this point, right? If you get a temperature change and it asks you anything about a specific heat or a, or a heat or a mass, we can do the algebra. We anytime you see a temperature change in energy units, your first thought should be this equation. Figure out what you have, what you're missing. Maybe do some unit conversions. If, it, if I do something um, cruel, like give you calories instead of joules, or if I give you pounds instead of grams. So there might be some conversions, but other than that, really the meanest thing I could do is give you, is ask you about Fahrenheit. You do everything in the right units, but make you convert your temperatures into Fahrenheit or from Fahrenheit to Celsius. There is a different specific heat value for water that's in that you can you can look it up. That's joules per gram degrees Fahrenheit or joules per pound degrees Fahrenheit or calories per pound degrees Fahrenheit. But it's more convenient to have this one memorized and know how to do the conversions than it is to have to go look up a different specific heat every time you're, you get a different combination of units. If you look up specific heat of water, there's an entire Wikipedia page, data page that's got probably probably close to 100 different values. Um, they're all the just different possible combinations of energy divided by mass divided by temperature. But this is the one that's going to be on your equation sheet. So stick with this one. And then you only have to memorize one value. All right, last but not least, what do we do for Q2? Yeah, we use that delta H. So we have 50 grams. For every one gram, 334 joules. Boom, easy peasy. We get something like 16,000. 3,700. You can either put that in kilojoules or put in scientific notation like we did over there 1.67 times 10 to the 4 joules. So I did not quite get this to scale. The slopes are close, close to the right amount. If this is 1.3, then this distance, that could be about four times that, right? Not that far off. This isn't nearly big enough, though, this plateau here, because this plateau should be double this length, roughly. If we did this experiment in the real world, if we actually just, yeah. We could, it does specify kilojoules. So 
That's easy enough though, right? Kilojoules to kilojoules, what do we do? Divide by a thousand. So 1.33 joules, 7.95, sorry, kilojoules. 7.95 kilojoules, 16.7 kilojoules. Thank you, Macy. If we, the, uh, I mentioned that uh, a good lab that I might have you do is watching ice melt. Um, it is basically making one of these from scratch where you just take a temperature reading every 30 seconds. You take a big beaker full of ice, you put it on a hot plate and you stick a thermometer in it and you just take a temperature reading every 30 seconds. So you're actually measuring time, not Q at the bottom, but you're assuming that the hot plate's gonna put out about a constant amount of, of heat per second, constant number of joules per second. If you do that, what would you expect to be different about this graph? It'll look close to this, but what's not quite perfect? But we get that the steepness here would be a little bit more accurate, the ratio to each other. The straight line. If we put a stir bar in the bottom, if we keep it really well mixed the whole time we're doing it, this part will be flat pretty well, but we won't have these sharp corners. What tends to start happening is you start to see some of the ice starts going through a phase change before the rest of it gets to the right temperature yet. It doesn't all stay perfectly mixed. And so you get something that looks more like that. But you definitely still see three distinct sections, which is kind of cool. It's not what you would expect because it seems like everything's sort of warming up gradually at the, at the same rate. But you do see, we can measure this and mathematically, it doesn't really matter that these things happen somewhat simultaneously. We can still break them apart and say, and, and do the calculations like it's three distinct processes. And we still will get the same total Q value for the whole process. It doesn't really matter that it flattens out or that it's got these rounded edges. For the sake of doing making the math easier, we can ignore some of the weirdness that happens around the corners. All right, we ready to be done talking about jewels for a little bit. Talk about science history some more, more concepts. All right, we talked about cathode rays, right? And we talked about how at the end of class, we talked about how this really threw a wrench in the atomic theory, right? Because we thought there was nothing smaller than atoms. And then we immediately find something that's 2000 times smaller than the smallest atom. And what did we decide to call that? An electron. So that's an elect, what an electron is, is this little tiny particle that has these negative, um, it has a negative charge. And if you apply a big enough voltage, you can get the electrons to fly out of the atoms and leave the atoms positively charged. And so we ended with the plum pudding model, right? This idea that an atom is just this big mass of positive goop, cake, pudding, take your, take your pig. And embedded within the pudding are these little negative electrons. And then everything that's left is just sort of vaguely positive charge. It has to add up to the right charge so that everything adds up to zero when it's neutral. But that the plum pudding model originally put forth that you had just that the electrons were distinct, but the positive charge wasn't. And then Thompson's student, Thompson was the one who put, put the plum pudding model out there. His, his own student, um, and I don't remember where I, where I heard this, what I was reading, but apparently this caused quite a, a rift between Thompson and Rutherford. They did not get along very well after this because Rutherford tried to prove Thompson's model correct, and then eventually basically wound up disproving it, which made Thompson very angry, um, despite the fact that he should have been proud of his students for 
um, disproving his theory. What happened is when Rutherford took this gold foil and he hammered it really, really thin, like only a couple atoms thick. So, so thin that you could see through it. Um, when he fired these large particles uh, with a positive charge that they knew about at the time called alpha particles, which again, we'll get into in more detail when we talk about nuclear chemistry, he was expecting the alpha particles to go straight through the gold foil and come out the other end and just be going slower. What he saw instead is that almost all of the alpha particles went straight through with no change to their velocity. Except that there were small fractions of them that wound up being deflected at very specific angles. And he took them, took Rutherford a while to put this together. Um, but basically what he came up with is that pretty much all of the space um, of an atom was empty. Atoms took up almost zero volume when you looked at where the positive charge was, where the mass was. So here's what, what was expected uh, on the left. Alpha particles move straight through, come out the other side, just going slower. Instead, we see almost all the alpha particles go straight through with no change in velocity. And some of them wind up getting reflected, basically. They bounce off of some really, really small, but really, really dense positive charge. So Rutherford came up with what's called the nuclear theory. Instead of the plum pudding model, plum pudding's out, nuclear theory's in. And the nucleus, um, which is, I believe that, that the nucleus is named after the biology nucleus. At this point, they had micros microscopes strong enough that they could look at a cell and see the nucleus of a cell. And so he basically said, okay, well, all of your mass is in the nucleus, just the way all the DNA, they didn't know what DNA was at the time, but just the way all of the, the DNA is in the nucleus of a cell in this much smaller area. Um, and he added to that the idea that the nucleus is made of a discrete number of positive particles called protons. And then the electrons are spread around the nucleus uh, and sort of balance out the charge. So basically Rutherford was one who came up with this idea that we have distinct protons is what he called the positive version of an electron. But they weren't exactly the same because the protons also had mass. The electrons were 2000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. But the proton was basically the same, the same mass as a hydrogen atom. So that gave, that gave one more sort of discrepancy. They knew hydrogen was the smallest atom and they knew it was by, when they started using the nuclear theory, that it, it had one proton. And they knew that helium had two protons. But the problem is, is that helium was four times heavier, despite only having twice as many protons. And so they basically just said, well, if we have electrons that are negatively charged and really small, we have protons that are positively charged and pretty big, a neutron is something that's pretty big with no charge. So neutron from neutral. Proton for positive, electrons are negative, neutrons are neutral. And they didn't really know much about neutrons at the time, but they knew that they had to exist because something was making up all that extra mass in the, in the helium nucleus. Right? They had ways at this point to measure what the what the total number of electrons on a helium atom was, and therefore figure out the total number of protons on a helium atom. And the difference in the mass was what led them to figure out that there had to be neutrons there. Mm. We wanna go through this one yet? Did I get these out of order again? All right. so. Let's define some of these terms then. We're going to use that nuclear theory and basically put it into the context of the periodic table. 
So the elements were basically, that's going back to the atomic theory, elements were just how you identify different types of matter. If you had a different type of atom or different element, you got a different type of material, period. And the way we identify the different types of elements is by what's called the atomic number. Right, and the atomic number is the is the whole number that on that periodic table is in the top left corner of each box. Um, on the ones that are on your desks, also in the top left corner. Perfect. Right, and so basically that that's going to be what defines an element is the atomic number. How many protons does it have in its nucleus? And then it's a little bit redundant, but you also have an atomic symbol. And the atomic symbol tells you the name of that element. Basically, it's an abbreviation for the most part um, for the name of that element. Why do I say it's redundant? Because the atomic number already defines it. But it's a lot easier to give things for, for humans. We respond better to giving things names than just putting a number to it. So instead of saying um, atomic number 29, we say copper. They mean the, literally the exact same thing. Um, in physics classes, a lot of times they'll use a capital Z to represent the atomic number. And they'll just see Z equals 29. And that literally means the atomic number is 29. Physicists will do anything to avoid having to use the periodic table. Physicists don't like the periodic table because there's all sorts of exceptions and rules that are usually true but aren't always. They don't like that. Um, I like to say that chemistry is just physics where we don't ignore the exceptions. So these atomic symbols are, are just the, the abbreviations. They're not the name itself. The name is slightly different. So the name is just the way you would write it out. Yeah. Um, so if we say the symbol is Na, what's the name? Sodium. I asked you about a tricky one right off the bat because that was what was up here. Most of them are pretty close to their actual name, right? So the element name is sodium. The, the atomic symbol is Na. The atomic number is 11. And they all mean the same thing. They're all different ways of saying the same thing. I, partly the reason we have atomic symbols and um, element names is also because it's a holdover from alchemy in the original research, not research at the time, but the original um, culture where you name things. And a lot of times if you look at the old alchemy, al the alchemical symbols, they're actually like, they kind of look like Greek letters. Um, like there's, that's a Greek, that's a symbol for air, I think. Um, and so a lot of this, it kind of starts looking, starts looking like occult symbols and pentagrams and stuff drawn if you start looking at this, this old alchemy stuff. Um, but it gave rise to, well, why would we use that when we can just put two letters to it and give it the atomic symbol that way? I believe that was the symbol for bromine, actually. But I don't remember specifically. <clears throat> Important note about capitalization. Anytime you write an atomic symbol, the first letter has to be capitalized and it needs to be distinct from your lowercase. So if you're, if you're a person that writes capital N's, it's just a big lowercase N, you can't do that because you, you act, actually have to change your handwriting a little bit when you're writing atomic symbols because you need this to be clear. You can't write N-A. It needs to be N-A. There's a couple other common ones that get confused. Make your eyes distinct from your L's, right? Upper, if you normally write your uppercase I's like that, you're gonna wanna change that because that could be really confusing. Is, is that a carbon and an iodine or is that a chlorine? It's 
unclear, right? It's like an ambiguous number. So if I do that, it's obvious that's carbon and iodine, right? Big one that I had to change as a student is I started making all of my lowercase l's when I'm doing atomic symbols. My lowercase l's, I write like that, specifically to differentiate between i's and l's. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but you just need to make sure you're, you're consistent and that somebody else reading your work, especially somebody who's going to be grading your work, can tell the difference between your capitals and your lowercase. The other big one is is m's or is the um, prefixes and units, right? Capital M, lowercase m versus lowercase m, lowercase m. What is that as a unit? Millimeters, what is that as a unit? Megameters, what is that as a unit? We haven't talked about concentration yet. This is a concentration unit. This is millimolar moles per liter, which has to do with how many atoms are there in, a, in one liter solution. I just want to take a second to point out, if everyone looks at their periodic tables, it looks like iodine's lowercase. Yeah, I think we covered this already. Our specific periodic tables, because they're new, it has a state of matter in a, uh, a square above iodine, meaning that it's solid at room temperature. So it looks like it's iodine with a square above it, so it looks like it's a lowercase i, but it's not. That square is is the is the solid okay, so it's, it's a capital still i just think you're on the topic at some yeah i i try to be really consistent with my font choice when i'm writing assignments so that so that with the fonts that i'm picking you don't get something like that one because you look at the i's versus the l's right there too that is the same issue i was just talking about right so we can do better than that just pay attention to the way you're doing it. try to be really consistent with it um, people don't struggle with that one nearly as much as they struggle with sig figs. So, um, it's not too big of a deal. Just be aware of it. Uh, you don't need to capitalize the element name. Element names are not proper nouns. So unless it's the beginning of a, of a sentence, you don't capitalize copper. You do capitalize CU. All right, and that'll matter more too once we get into nomenclature. How do we name these things? We're going to be picky about that too. Mary? Good question. So typically, there's a different enough context that you can tell the difference. It's not a bad idea, or you can go the European route of writing your ones like that. If you, anybody who grew up in Europe, typically just writes that for a one. Um, to me, that looks like an electron, the way we're gonna draw electrons, we do electron configurations. So, you know, I if you notice, I write my ones like that. You just have to be careful that it's clear that from the context what it is. And when it's not, add it. All right, any other, any other questions about capitalization or atomic symbols? So Roman, mm, so Roman numerals should also have, again, font choice is key, but I'm not going to write Roman numerals like this. I'll take the time to do that. That should make it a little bit easier. Um, but again, we're not going to use Roman numerals that much. They'll show up just a little bit when we do nomenclature. And again, from context, it's really obvious because if I do that, if you put it in the parentheses after a transition metal, that's telling you very specifically what the charge is. Well, again, we'll get to that in more detail. That's really the only place we use Roman numerals in chemistry. Um, and it it's really obvious if you're using the parentheses what's going on there. Those are both good questions and both questions nobody's ever asked me before. So congratulations. I'm still, I'm still getting new questions after 10 years of doing this. I appreciate that.
All right, so if there's no other questions about atomic symbols and names, then that leads me to your first in-class quiz. The, say, a week from Friday, and it's going to be atomic symbols and element names. I'm not just going to give you an empty periodic table and make you fill it out. You don't need to know where everything goes on the periodic table. It's going to be 20 questions where I, if I say silver, you have to fill in a G. And if I say, I don't know, tungsten, you have to say W. Or if I give you the symbol, you have to give me the name. So if I say AS, you have to say arsenic. A little bit of memorizing. Um, I don't like to say memorize for the sake of memorizing, but it's going to save you a lot of headache down the road because we'll be able to talk about the elements without getting bogged down and wait, which one is that? It's multiple choice if you consider 118 elements multiple choice. And I'm not going to give you a word bank. Um, is it going to be the whole It will be. It will be. It will be focused on the top five rows. Most of them will be in the top five or six rows. Okay. But there will be one or two at least from the bottom sections. And most of the, a lot of them you already know. This fight, you might panic initially, but a lot of them you already know or are close enough, they're close enough to be incognito, it won't take much study. Mary and then Macy? No numbers, just the names and symbols. I'm not, after you take this quiz, I'm never going to take your periodic table away from you again. So other than this quiz, you'll always have the periodic table. So I don't care if you memorize where it goes or what the numbers are. But if I say arsenic, I need you to be able to write AS. Or if I write CU, you need to be able to know without thinking twice about it that that's copper. Right? So once we get that down, there'll be one other quiz that's point blank to memorize this because I said so. Um, but then everything else, I will try to give you a reason and not just say memorize for the sake of memorizing. Macy? There will be some things. F block really belongs in rows six and seven. So it actually will be, I can, didn't even consider that as a different section when I said that. Yeah, the whole thing, including the F block. There will be a couple from down there. But again, out of the, there's going to be 20 that go this direction where I give you the name, you give me the symbol. And then 10 where I give you the symbol, you give me the name. And out of those, probably 20 out of those 30 elements are going to be common elements, things from, from row, row five and higher. Um, most of that is what I care the most about. Aria? If you give us like GY and we wrote the prosium, but we spelled something wrong, what do you think was wrong? It depends on how bad your spelling is. <laughs> um, basically, if you're, if you're close enough that somebody who knows chemistry could read what you wrote and get to the right element, then I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's good enough. So if you did like DI instead of DY or something. So if you did DI, if you're doing for the symbols, well, that, not for the symbols for yeah. The actual oh yeah, for the spell, yeah. yeah. That would be fine. If you leave out an entire syllable, okay, yeah, you're gonna right. get marked down. Or if you if it's an important letter, like if if you write L I N C instead of Z I N C, yeah. obviously right. that's a different thing. But if you spell it Z I N K, okay, somebody who's reading that probably still knows you meant same. Will you focus more on the top, let's say, 80 elements as opposed to the bottom ones, or is it equal focus? Um, no, it, it'll be, I mean, there's more from, from the first 80 by a long shot. At least probably three quarters of them are going to be from between 1 and 86. At, so there, will and, be and there will be a few, and that number three quarters is probably not even doing it justice. There's probably going to be you know, two or three from the F block, two or three from row from row seven at most, right? Most of it's going to be the stuff that you stuff you've already heard of, um, and most of them are pretty close to being cognates, right? It takes a little bit of practice, but they're not that bad. 
Melissa? So they'll be on there too, the ones that aren't on this list. Um, that I the one that's on the have all first. Yeah, so these ones, the ones that are taped to your desk, those ones have all the names. The one that's on the wall, all those those three letters uh, symbols have been replaced with with names. Um, so the UUP is is number one fifteen. So now that's Muscovia. You know, there's only one, there's one element on the periodic table now that actually was first discovered uh, until you get back into like archaeological times. But of the modern, the, the elements discovered in the last 300 years, only one of them was first discovered in Asia. Anybody know which one it is? It's named for an Asian country in that Asian country's language. Close. That was discovered in Russia, but in the European part of Russia. Um, it's Nihonium. Nippon, N-I-P-P-O-N in the English characters is the is the word for Japan in Japanese. So Nihonium is actually named after Japan. It was first discovered in Japan. Lots of so personally that helps me when I'm memorizing things is to give some context to the names rather than just you know memorizing a bunch of random words um, that have no meaning to me. Especially for the ones that don't where the names don't match up. Sometimes what helps me is actually going to why is silver a G instead of S I or something like that. It's because a lot of those so that one in particular is because it was actually named in Latin. And the Latin word for silver is argentum. Which is uh, close to the word for silver in Portuguese and Italian. I don't think Spanish. Spanish is plata, right? Who speaks Spanish in here? Where are my Fiji kids? Parker. Anybody remember? I think I think I think that plata is silver is silver um, in Spanish, but in um, in Portuguese, argento is silver. So a lot of them still have some comments like that. If you know where they came from, it, mercury is particularly interesting because that comes from Latin as well, from hydro argentum. <laughs> The HG for mercury is from the Latin hydro argentum. If you know that argentum means silver, what do you think hydro argentum means? Watery silver. Watery silver, because it's metal that's a liquid at room temperature. So hydro argentum actually does make sense. It's not just random letters thrown on there. I saw a hand, Mary. Some of them, yes. Sometimes the different letters are because you, they didn't have the letters available anymore, but right, exactly. And so uh, potassium is a good example and sodium is a good example. Those are both from Latin as well because they knew about them early on. Um, K, K is for callum, um, which was, it, they knew it as a, um, as the word, they used that for lye because potassium hydroxide is another word, is the chemical term for lye, L-Y-E that's used for making soap. Um, and MA is for, I think it's natrium, natrum. Um, but again, comes from the Latin for salt. W is an interesting one, tungsten, because that's actually, it is a different language thing, it's, but it's, as, as I recall the story, um, it's because tungsten was discovered almost simultaneously by two different research groups, one in England and one in Germany. And they, this was before they had telephones or anything like that. So they didn't have a way of proving who discovered it first. So they actually split the naming rights. They let the German group pick the symbol and the, and the English group pick the name. So the English group picked tungsten. The German group was calling it Wolfram. 
Wolfram, which I believe is the word, the, um, does anybody speak German in here? I think this is a letter in the Greek, or the way that they pronounce W in German is Wolfram. So tungsten gets the symbol W for historical reasons. If you're into the history side of things, it can be really interesting to learn about some of these other ones. Um, we'll talk about actually about a bunch of the ones that are named after people. We'll talk about the people that they're named after um, when we get to quantum mechanics next week. Um, in particular, there, Lisa Meitner, Meitnerium, MT, number 109, is named after Lisa Meitner, who was robbed of a Nobel Prize like Rosalind Franklin back in the 50s because she was a woman. Um, and so they made, up, made it up to her, if you could say that, after she was dead um, by naming an element after her. Um, there's a lot of stories like that when you get into some of these ones. Like um, Copernic, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Copernicium is named after Copernicus. Um, so there's Curium on there. There's Einsteinium on there. SG106 is named Seaborgium is named after a guy named Glenn Seaborg who did a ton of research in the in the 70s discovering elements in Lawrence Livermore Lab in Berkeley. So Lawrencium, Livermorium are both named after the Lawrence Livermore Labs in Embryville. Um, and Seaborgium was named by his students after he retired. Um, I actually used to have a periodic table signed by Glenn Seaborg. Um, because he used to live, he lived in Incline Village after he retired. Wait, what happened? Yeah. I lost it in the move somewhere. No, not I think I think I left it at Sierra Nevada College um, when I was teaching there. I got it there because it was that was in Incline yeah. Village. I'm pretty sure that it got lost in a drawer when I moved out of that office. It is. He's dead now, so I can't get that one back. But it's still a fun story. Oh, nothing. I don't know if you looked at memorabilia prices. Like sports memorabilia is not worth much. It seems like it's an investment inside. Um, and. And the market for chemists signing things is even smaller than the market for like Logan Webb signing things, right? So if Logan Webb signed baseball is only worth like a hundred bucks, then Glenn Seaborg signing a periodic table is worth, I don't know, maybe five. <laughs> more, worth more to me than it is um, monetarily. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, we've got... A few minutes. Is it possible that there are more elements that we have not found yet? Maybe. Does anybody know how we fill in the periodic table? Why those four now have names? Because we found them. We actually made them. Everything above, I want to say uh, uranium, is not, you cannot really find in the universe in, in, um, large amounts. I believe anything above uranium actually requires more energy than a supernova produces. So you can't actually produce anything past uranium in natural astronomical processes. Everything up to uranium, a supernova can produce. Wait. Wait. How does it create a particle generator? Exactly. You take you take chunks and you use a giant electromagnet to accelerate them to large fractions of the speed of light, like 90% the speed of light, and you slam them into each other. And sometimes the nuclei fuse together and you get a new bigger nucleus. Plutonium is made by enriching uranium. If you take uranium and you bombard it with neutrons, you can get it to go through a process to produce plutonium. Um, so it can occur naturally on Earth, um, but it's very, very short-lived in those instances to the point where it's never been observed in nature. Um, everything above uranium, and actually everything that's on the periodic table that on this one has parentheses around the mass number. So all the ones that look like that, they're not found in nature. They're only found in some of them, like technetium, 43. Technetium um, was one of the first, was I think it was the first synthetic element, the first time they made a new element in a lab that wasn't found in nature. Um, and that one 
would have been produced by a supernova, except that it's got a half-life such that it, it, it basically decayed and disappeared before humanity even existed, let alone knew to look for it. So the very, very early solar system probably had some technetium in it, but after a few hundred thousand years, it was all gone. Uh, a few hundred thousand years after the supernova that produced our solar system, the technetium had all decayed into other elements by then. You can look at the amount of energy. So the theoretical physics has gotten to the point where we can predict how much energy it takes to make these nuclei. And it would take a supernova with more energy. Basically, the size of a star that would have to go through a supernova would actually collapse into a black hole instead of going through a supernova. So it, yes except for the fact there's other astronomy things going on. Because it would all get pulled into the black hole. Right, as soon as your star, instead of going through a supernova, large enough stars will collapse on themselves instead of exploding outward when they run out of fuel. And that's what most black holes are created through. What happens to matter when it goes through black hole? I mean, there's, Basically, there's no way of knowing because the surface of a black hole is an information dead zone. Basically, there's no way of getting information out across the event horizon of a black hole. So anything, like the science in the movie Interstellar is really, really spot on until the very minute that they get to the black hole, at which point it's like, now we're just guessing uh, because there is no way of knowing what, what happens. And then how do we know that because we can prove it on smaller scales. You can actually, you actually need uh, to do those calculations just for GPS satellites to maintain their position properly above the Earth. GPS satellites are, are moving at a large enough speed relative to the surface of the Earth um, that you have to take relativity into account. So we can test relativity in smaller scales and then extrapolate. Um, and, and we can see, they've done experiments in different gravitational conditions with really, really sensitive instruments. And they can show that the gravity affects the way the path time passes. And then they can extrapolate that out to say, well, a black hole is the extreme version of that. What happens then? And basically it's that time stops existing. So could there be like In theory, yeah. We could keep making bigger and bigger elements because we can locally put more energy in to get past that threshold that even a supernova can. Um, we can also, based on the theoretical physics, say that, okay, these are the right ratios of protons and neutrons that are likely to make a stable nucleus. Um, and there's not really a whole lot of hope to find anything stable past about 125 protons. So if you notice row seven ends at 118, the predictions are that there should be a couple of pretty stable elements in the one, 121 to 123 range. And there should be some that we can make but will decay really fast, going up to about 125. Um, but then past that, it very quickly falls apart. You can't make anything that big because it just immediately splits into two smaller pieces again. Um, so that's, and that's, the specifics are beyond my expertise. You're getting into the theoretical physics of why those two forces kind of don't work nicely together once you get to a certain point. But basically, part of it is that you wind up with too many protons in one place, and protons are all positively charged. And what does positive charges do to other positive charges? Pushes them away, right? So the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force are such that we can get them to stick together with the right number of neutrons until we get past a certain point, and then they just fall apart. It'd be like trying to build a sandcastle that was 70 feet tall. Building sandcastles works really well up until you get to the point where the sand won't hold together anymore, right? All right. So a couple more points before, before we're done for today so that you have everything you need for tomorrow. <clears throat> so atomic number, element name, atomic symbol, all mean the same thing. They're different ways of saying the same thing. Mass number is a little trickier. 
because the mass number of an individual atom is, is the sum of how many protons plus neutrons it has. Basically, neutrons are just these neutral particles. Changing the number of neutrons doesn't change the charge, and it doesn't change what elements you have, but it does change how much that nucleus weighs. And we pick the, the um, defining the mass units that we use really carefully so that we're more or less dealing with whole numbers. So a mass number of 39.944 is really close to 40, right? And so we would look at that and say, okay, it, the total number of pieces in the nucleus has to add up to 40. So if the total number of pieces in the nucleus has to add up to 40, and we can figure, and we know the atomic number is 18, we can work out how many protons and neutrons there has to be. Because how do we know how many protons there are? It literally is the same exact thing as the atomic number. All you have to do is find your element on the periodic table, look at the atomic number, that'll tell you how many protons it is. So this argon has 18 protons. If the mass number is 40, how many neutrons does it have? Yeah, it's that easy, 22. Protons, the shorthand for protons is a lowercase p with a positive uh, charge. Lowercase because you don't want to mix it up with phosphorus. Phosphorus is the symbol for uppercase p, right? Or has the atomic symbol with an uppercase p. The shorthand for an electron is a lowercase e with a negative symbol, with a negative charge. So lowercase p with a positive charge is a proton, lowercase e with a negative charge is an electron. What's a neutron's shorthand? Lowercase n. Not with the plus one because it's neutral. Oh, sorry. Plus or minus. Uh, we actually put a zero there because it, it will never have a charge. And so to make sure that you're not mixing that up with some other unit or something like that and to make it so it matches here, protons, neutron, electron. So for an individual, for an individual atom, number of protons plus neutrons is equal to the atomic mass of that atom. All right, so here's a key, some key definitions. We already defined the first one. The number of protons in a nucleus determines, defines its what element it is. So if you change the number of protons in a nucleus, you change what element you have. If you know what the element is, but you and you know the charge, you can also figure out how many electrons you have. So anytime you've got a mismatch between protons and electrons, that's going to give you um, an overall charge. So let's see, make sure number of protons minus number of electrons is equal to charge. So for instance, if I said nitrogen with a, with a minus three charge, if nitrogen has a minus three charge, how many protons are in the nitrogen? So what defines proton or what defines protons? The number. So we go to the periodic table. Where's nitrogen? Number seven, right? Top right corner. So this nitrogen has seven protons. And if it has an overall negative three charge, how many electrons does it have to have? Exactly. Three extra electrons gives it an overall negative three charge. Right, so if, you're, if your atom is neutral, if it has zero charge, protons and electrons are going to be the same number. They're equal to each other. 
if you have a net charge, you just have to go through this process to count to figure out how many protons and then use the number of protons in the charge to figure out how many electrons you have. Right, so there's only three pieces that we're really varying here. We're varying the number of protons, that determines our element. We vary the number of electrons on an element, that determines our charge, what ion it is. If we vary the number of, of neutrons, if we vary the mass, then that is it makes it a different isotope. So that argon example we did a second ago, we said, okay, argon with, with 18 protons and 22 neutrons, that's a specific version of argon that we call an isotope. A, in a specific isotope just means you're being careful about how many neutrons it has. Most elements that we see in nature on Earth are a mixture of different isotopes. So, for instance, carbon, if you are chlorine is a better example. If you look at the mass on, number on chlorine on the periodic table, I keep pointing over there, but you can look at the one on your table as well. Chlorine has a mass of 35.45, right? 454. Depends. So off by one in the last digit, that's your uncertainty at work, right? That's not really close to 35 or 36, right? That's because chlorine naturally is a mixture of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Chlorine 35 has a mass number of 35. So if chlorine, and the way we write that is, um, in, if you put your charge up into the right, you put your mass number up into the left. So chlorine 35 has how many protons? Not 35. Chlorine 35 is 17. Check the periodic table. It's number 17, right? So it's got 17 protons and 17 plus what? Plus 18. There's our 18 for the number of neutrons. Chlorine 37 is a different isotope. It's still chlorine. It still has the same chemical properties as chlorine, but it's just heavier. So chlorine 37 still has 17 protons because it's still chlorine. How many neutrons does it have? Seventeen minus th or thirty-seven minus seventeen, twenty neutrons. So the reason that the, the mass number on the periodic table is not close to an even whole number is because these naturally occur. And when I say naturally, I mean we find them in nature at a roughly a three to one ratio. We don't have just chlorine thirty-five or just chlorine thirty-seven on Earth. We have a, a three to one mixture of chlorine thirty-five to thirty-seven. When we average those out, you get you get this, right? So let me double check. I don't think they have to do any weighted average. I think if anything, what we need is um, this. What are we at? We have three minutes left. Thank you. All right. All right, so here's what we're going to do. The front page of this assignment, you can get done with what we talked about today, counting protons, neutrons, and electrons, using these symbols, using the charges. The back part of this assignment, um, you'll be able to do after either Monday or Friday's lecture. I'll leave it up to Tom's. Um, where he's going to talk to you about how to convert from grams per mole or grams to moles or and doing um, weighted averages. Okay? Um, you guys, I'm out tomorrow, so make sure you get the front side done. And if work on the energy one. Yeah, and if you guys take my 10-1 class, you should be able to do this. 
Pretty straightforward. If you haven't taken it, help the people that are seeing this for the first time. Okay, these are teachers. Okay. If you take it 10-1, you should be able to do the back side as well. If you have it, find a 10-1 graduate. So there, because we're not doing a lot this week, we're going to be suspended instead. Yeah, so do you want me to lecture?